one of my uh, talks, this retreat, is aimed at um, looking at different ways to overcome some of the obstacles to loving kindness, um, drawing on the suttas. And I have a wonderful book here called Social and Communal Harmony by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, which I've actually been running as an ongoing Zoom session for uh, my online people. And uh, it's taken us almost two years and we've still not finished the book. <laughs> because there seems to be quite a lot to discuss, and especially on subjects such as anger and resentment, which is one of the most obvious obstacles to our happiness. Of course, we have other um, afflictions of our mind, like greed or sensuality or um, sadness. Sadness is, in a sense, a kind of internalized anger, but much softer than that. But I think anger is something that's very obviously harmful and hurtful and unpleasant. You know, other things can seem to be pleasant, such as craving. We have this anticipation of some reward, and we can easily get addicted, actually, not necessarily to the reward, but to the very act of craving. It feels good, you know, it gives us a feeling and uh, a reason to live, in a way. And uh, the Buddha actually said that we're kind of addicted to wanting. This is one of the difficulties we have. But um, anger is also relatively easy in that sense to overcome precisely because it's so unpleasant and it's very easy to, um, to notice in the mind. Yeah? So um, just re briefly recapping on um, this definition of loving kindness as something like unconditional love, I also wanted to just draw on a note that came to me uh, this morning where someone was saying it's quite difficult sometimes to hear that this is like the love that a mother has for a child because not all mothers or not all relationships between parent and child are necessarily healthy. Um, some can be very harmful. And um, it's important to recognize that this is talking about a loving mother's love. <laughs> But not only that, because even a loving mother can have a lot of attachment, you know, unless we're already noble beings who've actually uprooted a lot of the um, anger and ill will in our minds, then that love is still going to have its preference towards one's own child, whatever one takes as a part of oneself. So I've noticed that in a mother's love, they're a human being, right? And there is some measure of genuine loving care that wants you to thrive and to flourish. Um, but there's also a lot of attachment, maybe a lot of in, uh, vested interest, and that can, of course, lead to control, lead to unhealthy relationships, and uh, in the same way that anyone's relationship can be unhealthy. And sometimes the closer we are, the more difficult it can be. So remember in this sutta, it actually says... Even as a mother protects with her life her child, so it's about protection. It's not saying she always um, feels uh, loving towards that child necessarily. To all living beings, we generate that same feeling. And this is the difference. Yeah? I mean, if a mother's love was sufficient as a gauge of meta, as a gauge of a meta, um, boundless heart, then most women <laughs> who have had children wouldn't need to practice meta. But, of course, it hasn't actually gone to that extent that it's overcome and uprooted the uh, defilement or affliction of ill will in the mind. So it is not um, in itself a measure of loving kindness in the boundless and unconditional sense. Um, so real loving kindness is a kind of prevention in the first place, like a kind of um, preventative medicine from ill will arising, but it's also the cure. It's also like a, a pill that you take. And both of these methods of medicine boost our mental health. They uh, boost our immune system. They give us more confidence, more happiness to share. Um, we tend to take better care of ourselves. And when we don't take those medicines, then our sickness remains. And the Buddha said that somebody with a mind overwhelmed with hatred and anger even to the point that they don't really ever have a peaceful state of mind or a loving state of mind, is someone who's gravely sick. Yeah? And when that person's gravely sick, of course, it's a vicious circle as well. They don't feel good, then they kind of take it out even on themselves, they have poor self-care, and their whole mental state kind of goes down. 
um, leading to depression, anxiety, etc. Um, so these obstacles are quite important to work on. And my main approach in the practice is usually to build up the, the beautiful qualities, like to cultivate the flowers. But sometimes we want to at least understand what the weeds are and have some ways to kind of work around them or actually uproot them a little bit. So a lot of this is about perception and the way we train our perception. It's a part of the practice called sense restraint, um, which is not very often taught, but is an important part of what the Buddha called the gradual training. And that begins with a little bit of confidence, having heard the Dhamma, having confidence that these things are worth trying out at the very least. And then that leads to uh, the wish and the motivation to live an ethical life. And of course, to live that ethical life, we have to be developing degrees of mindfulness to be aware of what actions lead to our well-being and the well-being of others and what actions lead to harm. And along with that, this is usually uh, sila or virtue is usually discussed at the level of body and speech, the active aspects of the way we relate to one another. But the sense restraint is more like looking at the ethical conduct of our minds, the way we use our minds, the way we attend, the way we perceive, the way we think about things and situations and people that we encounter in our lives. And so the virtue starts to go inside. And this, again, involves a lot of mindfulness to see what we're up to in our minds. And uh, not only to abstain from contact that may be triggering or harmful in some way, because that's only a kind of temporary measure to give ourselves some respite, to give ourselves some space from a situation we find difficult. And, you know, in retreat also we can practice with full-on sense restraint in terms of just not looking around. There's a story about Ajahn Chah, and uh, it might be encouraging to know that even a great master like Ajahn Chah really struggled, in his case, with loss. And... I can imagine that's quite difficult for the monks sometimes when they see women every day feeding them food, right? Maybe dressed up and I don't know. I'm not blaming it on the women. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of the things that can be difficult. And he thought, okay, for the next three months, I'm just going to look down. I'm not going to raise my eyes once to see any woman. And this is going to help me to work with this issue from the inside. So trying to take some responsibility for that. Um, but actually what happened is that he managed to curtail um, this particular problem and uh, by restraining his senses, by not looking around. But then after the retreat, as soon as he opened his eyes and he saw any woman, <laughs> not particularly beautiful or you know, certainly not interested in him, um, <laughs> an enormous amount of lust arose in the mind and then he realised, goodness, this does not work. Right? So the Buddha had different methods. And this is, I actually prefer the word guarding the senses than restraining the senses for this, because it's as though you're looking at your relationship between you and whatever object is coming to your mind. And you're aware of, again, that space between awareness and what it's aware of, the knower and the known, or the knowing and the known. You're aware of that space and you're aware of the kind of hindrances that might arise there. So whether lust is arising in relation to that object or irritation, anger, um, grief, fear, whatever it might be. And then we actually change the way we perceive that person. So in the case of lust, we might, instead of looking at their beautiful eyes or um, you know, having some fantasy about them that just obscures the faults, we actually look for some fault, for some defect. Or we can just look at them, and I think this is more beautiful. We can learn to look at one another as brothers and sisters on the path, right? Brothers and sisters and gender non-binary people, however they might identify. You know, we can just look at them as fellow beings in this realm of suffering who want to be free. Um, one of Ajahn Brown's methods, he didn't have any particular problem with loss, but a little method that he used, it was enough for him to see a pimple. <laughs> to realise that, you know, what's on the outside might look kind of appealing because it's concealing a lot of stuff on the inside that's not, right? <laughs> on the inside, if you just scrape a little bit of skin or something, it's quickly quite repulsive. You know, you get the blood or whatever. If there's a pimple and you squeeze it, you get the pus, 
there's nothing particularly attractive about that. And this is just to balance the mind. If it goes too far, it can lead into the opposite, which is aversion. So this is just to be aware of what's going on in our mind and to balance it by um, using perception in a skillful way, in the right measure as well. And then on the other side, of course, if we're having a lot of irritation towards a person, the Buddha had different ways to deal with that. And um, one of the things that I always find the most helpful is actually to see that when a person acts in an unskillful way that harms another, it has to start off by them harming themselves because it's impossible to harm another person if we're full of loving kindness, at least not intentionally harm. You know, not really in a damaging way. Even if you harm by accident, if you have a lot of loving kindness, you can easily ask forgiveness. You can easily approach that person in a skillful way and try to repair the harm, right? But, uh, yeah, it's really helpful to have that perspective of right view to understand that we're all basically owners of our karma and subjected to um, the conditioning that we've had throughout our lives. If we haven't been shown love, if we haven't been shown what it means to be a good friend or to be loyal in a relationship, respectful in a relationship, then it's very, very hard to, um, to know that how that is and to behave that way ourselves, right? So it's not our fault. We can forgive ourselves and hopefully we can learn to forgive others that way. So the aim of this is very uh, lofty. You know, uh, the Buddha basically said that hatred can never be overcome by hatred. By love alone is it overcome. And one who harbors thoughts such as, they hurt me, they abuse me, they rob me, um, will only be cultivating ill will. You know, if you roll in these things and think about these things and reflect on them in that way, there's more and more cause for harm, for feelings of um, anger, feelings of dejection, um, for resentment to form in the mind. So, you know, there are different kinds of anger. There's an anger that arises very quickly, and it might be quite venomous, but, uh, you know, quite virulent, and the Buddha likens this to the poison of a snake. You know, it can be very uh, strong poison, but it also subsides very quickly. Or it can arise quickly and not be very virulent, and also subside quickly. But it can also arise quickly and then stay for a long time, or it can arise slowly and stay for a long time, right? And he likened this to kind of lines drawn on rocks. He said that... Um, the kind of anger that arises quickly and disappears very quickly is like a, a line drawn on um, water. You know, so if you move your finger through water, you might see the trace of your finger, but it closes up immediately, almost immediately. Another one is like the line drawn on sand. So it doesn't take long before the winds or the sea comes along and washes that sand back into a flat shape. But the last one, which is the anger that, you know, sustains itself, and partly through such thoughts as they did this to me, they did that to me, how could they, don't they know how sensitive I am or whatever. You know, it's natural to think these ways. But this can unfortunately dig that anger deep down like a line drawn on rock or stone with chisel and hammer. You know, you're digging it in. And still, it's not intractable. It's not intractable because we have these methods and ways to start overcoming some of that. So, um, one of the first things we can do, like I said, is that perceptual shift, um, having compassion for the person who's hurt us. Um, of course, loving kindness as well, if, um, if, especially as an antidote, or if the hurt is not too deep, or if we've developed a lot of loving kindness already through the loved person and the neutral person. And in some texts, um, where the Buddha's talking to monastics in daily life, He's actually saying to start with the difficult person, which is interesting, because he doesn't usually talk about a sequence, but there's one place where he says, um, if somebody approaches us with bad speech and, um, you know, in a very aggressive way, and a re resentment arises, then starting with them, we generate loving kindness, and then we start to spread it in all directions. And I think this is important to notice, that it's possible to do this sometimes, to nip something in the bud, if you like, before it actually gets intractable um, and entrenched. You know, we can actually see, oh, a bit of irritation has arisen here. Let me be like the earth. This is a teaching he gave to his son. Let me be like the earth. Whatever's thrown on the earth, the earth doesn't complain. Unfortunately, now the earth is really crying loudly, screaming for our help, 
right? But if you take this context in the, in the situation it's meant for, you know, just think of the vast earth. You can't actually take away the earth. You know, the earth remains stable, it remains uh, solid. Similarly, the Buddha says, make your mind like the sky. You know, the sky can have all kinds of things passing through it, dirty winds, pollution maybe, but eventually it passes through, it doesn't stick, and the sky remains pure, remains clear. So he used these similes, he said, be like the water, be like the fire that burns things up immediately. Whatever impurities come into a fire, the fire just burns them up and uh, they disappear. So we can make our minds big, wide, vast, and these things won't have much of a chance to stay. But also in that little uh, list of things to help us overcome ill will, um, as well as compassion uh, and loving kindness, there's also equanimity, which involves applying the law of karma to a person's actions, realizing that we can try our best to help a person. We can try and guide them, we can try and treat them well, treat them with loving kindness, forgive them, give them another chance. But eventually we can't be responsible for what another person does. They are responsible for their own actions and they will reap the fruits of that, for good or for worse. Um, and that can give us a sense of equanimity. It's not that we become aloof and uncaring, but it's more that we do our best knowing that we can only take care of the quality of our intentions. We can't make another person change or feel better or behave a certain way that we'd like them to behave. We can only lead by example at the very best. And sometimes we have to take a step back. Sometimes we have to just observe from a distance that, okay, this person is now, they've had the best input they can have, or maybe not. <laughs> I've done my best, but now it's up to them to find their way. And sometimes equanimity is likened to the love of a mother. And again, a loving parent, a loving guide, let's say. It can be anybody. This is just using that example, because generally a mother has a particularly strong kind of love towards a child. Not always, because of various reasons, maybe they didn't weren't shown love themselves. But um, in this kind of case, you know, it's like uh, the mother who has reared that child with a lot of loving kindness. Um, that loving kindness changes to compassion, perhaps when that child is sick. At that time, the love turns into a tender care that that person be free from sickness, free from suffering, and that's what we call compassion. And then the mother rejoices with the child when they start to succeed in their life. Yeah, when they start to uh, have maybe a good relationship or you can see that the child's become independent and is uh, pursuing a, a good livelihood, then the mother rejoices with that child's success. That is like mudita, sympathetic joy. And lastly, a mother has equanimity when that love that's reared the child now has a little bit more perspective and letting go and the child leaves home and sets about on their journey, sets about on their life. Maybe they don't call you up every day or not even every month, when I went to India, it could be a couple of months before I could get to a phone and then I had to wait in a queue in the telegraph office in the capital city and you got your 10 minutes and uh, sometimes the line didn't work. So my mother had to really be very patient and I'm sure she was really worried and now I look back and think, gosh, she endured quite a lot <laughs> for my freedom <laughs> of body at least. Um, and so the mother has equanimity. It's not that we don't care but it's that we understand everyone has their path to follow and we can only do so much. And interestingly enough, in the same list of uh, ways to deal with a person who generates uh, maybe anger or resentment in us, an unhealthy relationship or maybe an abusive relationship, this would apply especially truly, is to ignore that person, um, which I think I mentioned earlier in this retreat, but it's very interesting because it's giving us permission and even encouragement to ignore something that's difficult to deal with. And the reason for that is because we might need to recover our own balance of mind, our own well-being, before we can be any use to anyone else. And uh, the length of time that we would choose to stay away from a person could be for life. I don't see why not. My teacher has a lovely phrase. He says, sometimes you have to love the tiger from a distance. <laughs> And as I said, you know, in my own experience with this very, very close friend who actually ordained with me and later became physically abusive, I am probably not going to rekindle that friendship. 
I am in touch with her family and I'm quite good friends with her with one of her family members and uh, even they have advised me not to do it unless there's anything in it for me because I don't owe it to that person to make them feel better about what happened or to uh, pretend that that was okay you know I never received a proper apology so I'm not confident that the healing on their part has been done and has been addressed but I can abide without ill will I don't make that a part of my identity. I've managed to heal through practicing loving kindness in different ways and I can think of her with loving kindness if she comes to mind but I won't directly intentionally go out there and feel it's my job to send loving kindness to her. Although it could be an interesting one to try because I, I do think it would flow quite easily now. Um, but the point being that you can develop your heart without having to associate with people that trigger and hurt you. And in fact, it's better to have that sense of self-protection. It's called compassion, self-compassion. Be kind to yourself, you know, give yourself the best chance to thrive. So we have to make this decision for ourselves, depending on the situation. Um, and also, of course, if you are in an abusive situation, take a lot of support, as much as you possibly can from the people around you, um, to remove yourself from that situation when it's safe, at least as safe as possible to do so. So, I wanted to go a little bit more into uh, the use of perceptions and read directly from one of the suttas um, on dealing with anger and resentment. And this is actually from the Buddha's first disciple, or right-hand monk, let's say, because he did have right-hand nuns as well. Uh, the Venerable Kemar, she was the one foremost in wisdom, and she um, had such great wisdom that it was, I'm sure, equivalent to the Buddha himself. But Venerable Sariputta was the monk who um, was known to have equivalent wisdom to the Buddha. So here it says, um, the, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the monastics, I'll say, because it always says monks. <laughs> and part of the reason for that is because, probably of the way these suttas were written down, but also because the Buddha would address the senior most members of a community and the bhikkhu sangha, the monks, came first. It doesn't mean that nuns weren't present. It could mean that lay people were present, but we just don't know. Sometimes it's very clear that they are, sometimes it's less so. But this applies to us all. And remember that the Buddha here was talking to the community of monastics to engender harmony within it. Because again, without harmony, without that sense of safety, it's very hard to practice, if not impossible, because we're too busy trying to fix all the interpersonal problems, etc., and we just might not feel safe enough to relax. So here, um, the Venerable Sariputta addresses the monastics thus. Friends, there are these five ways of removing resentment by which a person should entirely remove resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. What five? Here, a, bodily, a person's bodily behaviour is impure, but their verbal behaviour is pure. Number two, a person's verbal behavior is impure, but their bodily behavior is pure. Number three, a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind. And number four, a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure, and they do not gain an opening of the mind or placidity of the mind. And lastly, a person's bodily behaviour and verbal behaviour are pure, and they do gain from time to time an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind. And in all cases, one should remove resentment towards such people. So this is just kind of sketching the different ways in which uh, people can be um, impure, if you like, to use the language here, or the behaviour can be impure, yeah? It always actually talks about behavior rather than a person because there's nothing intrinsic about us at all. And we can change our behavior with body and speech. And it's interesting to me that um, even the person whose behavior, bodily and speech is pure, <laughs> still we can have resentment towards them. <laughs> right? So sometimes this shows that it's not about another, is it? It's about us. Maybe we have jealousy. Maybe we think, why are they so popular? You know, I'm sure there's some defilement somewhere. They're just doing it for fame and for fortune or whatever, you know. Or maybe it makes us feel insecure. It makes us judge ourselves rather harshly in comparison. We compare. We have this terrible comparing mind, which is 
nothing but suffering for everyone, and rather based on delusion. So um, the point is here that there's always something, usually, that we can focus on that's good in a person. So this is how we use our mind, how we use perception. And there's some beautiful examples given. So the first one, how, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily behavior is impure, but verbal behavior is pure? Suppose a rag-robed monastic sees a rag by the roadside. And in those days, monastics used to make their robes from rags, some of them in any case. They would press it down with their left foot, spread it out with their right foot, tear off an intact section and take it away. So too, when a person's bodily behaviour is impure, but the verbal behaviour is pure, on that occasion one should not attend to the impurity of bodily behaviour, but instead attend to the purity of the verbal behaviour. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So this is quite interesting, and in that simile, uh, the person's actually taking away (coughs) that part of the cloth that can be used. So to me, this implies also not only (coughs) noticing the person's verbal behaviour, but perhaps also making use of the good behaviour that they have, and engaging with that part of the person, bringing it to light, encouraging it, you know, trying to bring it to the forefront of our mind, but also the other person's as well. And maybe even praising them, you know, for the things they say that are kind, even if they don't always act that way. And of course, these aren't fixed. It's not that one person has only impure bodily behavior and and great verbal behavior. It's just that from time to time, it applies to us all, right? Sometimes we speak in a harsh way, but we didn't really mean it. And actually, later, we do something really lovely for that person. Other times, you know, we can be doing all kinds of good things, but just speaking, yeah. Again, really harshly. I had an example of that in uh, years ago. It was the last job I had <laughs> in 2001 in a care home and working with a group of women who were very motivated and quite coarse. I mean, one of the women I worked with had pretty foul language. It was like effing this, effing that the whole time. Um, really quite, you know, coarsely, she would say it <laughs> with a lot of oomph. But then she'd go around. Yeah, she'd go around and looking after people who were soiling themselves, you know, several times in the night. These were people with um, last stages of dementia um, in, a, in a big nursing home. Really, they should have been in one-to-one, I think, by then. So it was quite appalling conditions, quite shocking. And she was so dedicated to cleaning them up, giving them all the care she could. And a lot of the speech was just an indication of how kind of passionate she was about her job. And she said to me, you know, I could get better pay working in the supermarket, but then who would look after these people? And she had genuine love for them. She really did. She was really awesome, actually. We actually got to be friends, and I told her about my trips to India and a little bit about meditation. But her speech never changed. It just didn't bother me anymore. I didn't define her by that, you know. I just realized this is her conditioning. This is the way she expresses herself. So that's the second example of persons who, whose verbal behavior is impure, but bodily behavior is pure. And here it says, the example given, suppose there was a pond covered with algae and water plants. A person, it always says a man, but it should be a person, (laughs) might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. They would plunge into the pond, sweep away the algae and water plants with their hands and drink from cupped hands and then leave. Isn't that lovely? So you actually plunge into that person's goodness. You drink from it to quench your anger, to soothe the flames, put the flames out of any resentment that might arise in your heart. And then the third one is a person whose bodily behaviour and verbal behaviour are impure, but sometimes they gain that opening of mind. So that means they are able to calm themselves and to have some good mental states arising. Suppose there were a little water in a puddle. Then a person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. Isn't that how we feel when we have resentment? It exhausts us. We get a boost in the beginning. It feels like, yeah, I'm right. You know, I'm kind of justified in this rage. And it solidifies a sense of self, right? Me as the person who's been harmed or who has this even kind of... Um, righteous indignation. It can sometimes seem quite morally motivated. But eventually we become weary, thirsty and parched. Then they would think this little bit of water 
is in the puddle. If I try to drink it with my cupped hands or a vessel, I'll stir it up, disturb it and make it undrinkable. So they get down on all fours and suck it up like a cow <laughs> and depart. So that's what they do. And in the same way, when a person's bodily behaviour and verbal behaviour are impure, but from time to time they gain an opening or placidity of the mind. And actually the word is vivadana, which is like the opposite of nivadana, which is used for the hindrances. So I think really what it's saying here is that the mind is temporarily free from the hindrances. One should not attend to the impurity of bodily and verbal behaviour, but should instead attend to the opening of mind, the placidity of mind they gain from time to time. So it's almost like we have to be very careful, very gentle in approaching such a person and in uh, connecting with what might be good, maybe at the right time as well, when they're not kind of involved in that kind of mental and, sorry, verbal and bodily behaviour that's afflictive. And then this one's really beautiful, and this one relates to compassion. How should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behaviour are impure and does not gain that opening of mind, that vivarana mind from time to time? And I'm sure we can think of people who fit into this category. No names needed. Suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was travelling along a highway and the last village behind them and the next village ahead of them were both far away. They would not obtain suitable food and medicine or a qualified attendant. They would not get to meet the leader of the village district. Another person travelling on the highway might see them and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern, thinking, oh, may this person obtain suitable food, suitable medicine and a qualified attendant. May they get to meet the leader of the village district, who would have made sure that everyone in that district was safe and housed in those times. For what reason? So that this person does not encounter calamity and disaster right here. Because that's where they're headed. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behaviour are impure, etc., etc., one should arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern, thinking, oh, may this person, it actually says may this venerable one, which is interesting because it doesn't say that in the other ones. So that you can even have respect and genuine care for this person, realising that they're in a very bad situation. Oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehaviour and develop good bodily behaviour. May they abandon verbal misbehaviour and develop good verbal behaviour. May they abandon mental misbehaviour and develop good mental behaviour. For what reason? So that with the breakup of the body after death, they will not be reborn in a plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower realm, in hell. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So even if you believe or you don't believe in these um, realms after this life, we can understand that this person might already be in hell if they're you know, not able to get the food, the medicine, the attendance that they need. And in a way, this is a simile for the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, right? That qualified attendant could be seen as the Sangha, the community of people around that take care of us. The medicine is like the Dhamma, yeah? The village leader could be like the Buddha, the person showing us the way. And this person is far from that. They can't even access those things. Isn't that the case that most often when people behave in unskillful ways, it's because they haven't heard the Dhamma, they haven't heard or actually received good training, good teaching, good examples in their life of how to be. So we can have this really deep sense of concern and compassion. The more we understand the results of karma, the results of mental behavior, because we understand that this person is headed, here it says, for calamity, for disaster. Right? And we, even if we are the victim of a lot of harm, you know, that's a temporary suffering and it's not to diminish that suffering. But from a karmic perspective, if our minds are pure and if our minds don't kind of sink to that level of depravity, if you like, and we don't inflict the same harm on another, then actually we're better off in the end. 
Yeah, we're protected by our own good karma. And lastly, how should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are pure and, from who and who from time to time gains an opening of mind, placidity of mind? Suppose there was a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean and smooth banks, a delightful place shaded by trees. Then a person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. Having plunged into the pond, they would bathe and drink, and then, after coming out, they would sit or lie down in the shade of a tree right there. <coughs> so too, when a person's bodily and verbal behaviour are pure, and from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, on that occasion one should attend to that person's pure bodily behaviour, pure verbal behaviour, to the opening and placidity of mind that they gain. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. These are the five ways of removing resentment by means of which a person can entirely remove resentment towards whomever it has arisen. So I think the last one is also very beautiful because it's almost as though rather than having resentment or jealousy, we see that this person has so much compassion and so much goodwill. <laughs> And we make use of that. We go to them for refuge. You know, this is how I see myself going to talk to my teachers. I might be feeling terrible, but if I can't talk to them about it, who can I talk to? I have trust that they will receive me in a beautiful way and they'll actually end up soothing some of that pain in my heart, you know. And I can take refuge. I can take shelter there. I can lie down under the shade. And I'm sure, I hope anyway, that most of us here have experienced how it feels to be with somebody who's really caring and non-judgmental and has a certain peacefulness about them. It's like we can feel our whole system starting to relax and uh, soften and such people often also see the best in us and it helps us to see the best in ourselves. We start to feel better about ourselves or we feel that we're okay as we are. You know? I hope that everybody has had this experience of feeling really accepted and embraced as they are. And if you have, even once, even if you can reflect on it once, Bring it up in your mind, especially at the beginning of a meditation. It can be really helpful to, um, to just feel a sense of being held, of being okay, of being good enough. Because sometimes the resentment is towards ourself, and somebody mentioned that yesterday. And in this case, we need a lot of self-compassion, you know, being kind to ourselves. But it's interesting, because there have been some studies on these aspects of compassion, self-compassion, um, that Christian Neff made. Christian? Christian. Or... Kristen Neff. Kristen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kristen Neff made popular. And uh, one aspect is like self-kindness uh, as opposed to judgment. So we develop more kindness compared to judgment. One aspect is um, we think of our common humanity rather than... Um, hmm, which one is that the opposite of? Common humanity as opposed to feeling isolated. So in other words, when things arise for us, we try to reflect that everybody goes through the same, right? It's a part of life that we experience loss of a loved one, for example. Um, maybe that involves going to some kind of support group where you can talk to other people who've experienced similar. And it really helps. The Buddha used that method too in his teachings. When um, a woman came to him, I think she was still a laywoman, and uh, her son had died, and she was absolutely devastated. In ancient India, the birth of a son was like, you've made it in life. And for a long time, she hadn't been able to give birth, and uh, she'd been rejected by her in-laws, by her husband, she'd been abused. And finally, she bore a son, and loved this son immensely. And that son died very young, when he was still a baby. So she went to the Buddha and she said, please, she was crying, she was desperate, please give some medicine for this son to make him come back to life. He's not dead, he's not dead, just give him some medicine. And uh, she was in denial, but of course she knew he died. Um, she just had no other hope. So she went to the Buddha thinking perhaps his psychic powers could do something there. And he said, okay, I'll give some medicine for your child. He said, go to every house in the village and ask for some mustard seeds. You know, these are mustard seeds that pop, you make them in a curry, 
if anyone knows how to make Indian food. Uh, go and get some mustard seeds and bring it back here. And she said, yes, 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 I can do this. She was very excited. And then he said, but the caveat here is that you have to bring them back from a house where nobody's died. So then she went around the village and she went from house to house, only about 20 houses or so, and she asked for the mustard seed, and they said, you take a whole bag of mustard seeds, you know, you take as many as you want if your son can come back to life. Um, and then she had to ask, but has anyone died here? And then, of course, they said, well, actually, yeah, my grandma died, or my nephew died, or my friend died, my husband died, my child died. And then she had to go to the next house. And this continued for a whole day until she came to her senses and realized everybody dies. At any age, people can die. You know, it's like a, a tree's branches. A tree's branches in a storm, sometimes the leaves and the branches that fall are most likely to be the old ones, the dead ones. You know, the ones that you'd expect to come down. But sometimes the wind takes the young green ones too. So this is the way it goes in life. People can die at any time. And when we can realize that these things aren't personal to us, and we can find some comfort, some solace in connecting with others, perhaps, who've been through the same, then, um, then this is a form of self-compassion. And the last one is actually um, having awareness, more awareness, more mindfulness, and I would say kindfulness, um, as opposed to over-identification. So we can get too close to ourselves, and uh, not see that there's that gap between our experience and the thing knowing that experience. There's that gap where we can have some perspective, we can have some equanimity there or some kindness. But the interesting thing about the study I wanted to point to is that um, this was a follow-up study that tried to find out whether any of these um, aspects of self-compassion are mutually reinforcing. So if there's more self-kindness, does that mean there's... Uh, more of a sense of common humanity, will it increase that as well? And, you know, do they all mutually strengthen each other? And it was found that self-kindness has no effect on increasing self-compassion or <laughs> increasing uh, the other factors. But reflecting on our common humanity and having awareness as opposed to over-identification increases everything. It increases self-kindness and it increases all of the other factors too. And I find that so interesting because a lot of what we think of as self-kindness is still a little bit too self-centered, too narrow, too kind of maybe plaster on the wound. Maybe it involves self-indulgence rather than self-kindness and buys into this big industry, you know, of like have extra bubble bath or you know, go and treat yourself to a very expensive spa, right? Mm -hmm. But to me, this shows the genius of the Buddha in beginning the Eightfold Path with right view, because right view is what gives that perspective of our common humanity, you know, the situation we're all in together, that there's suffering, and suffering is universal. There's a cause of suffering which is universal, and the solution, the Dhamma, the path, the Eightfold Path, is also a universal cure, it's a universal remedy. If it wasn't universal, then it wouldn't be the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the Dhamma because it applies to all. It's a law of nature. It's not a religion. It's not a sect. So this is very interesting. And I think this is also a reason that we um, practice loving kindness to all, not only to ourselves. And it's really when it becomes expansive in that way that we can say we've developed that loving kindness. But the, it is interesting to work with a difficult person because... Um, in a way, that is the culmination, the purpose, the aim of loving kindness. It's to overcome that ill will. And it's almost as though if the fire is strong enough, at that point it actually leaps. The mind leaps towards kind of the aim of the loving kindness and becomes very strong um, in order to overcome that ill will. And uh, sometimes, of course, um, it's more likely that in the beginning, maybe for years, uh, we can only work with a difficult person for a short time without having, you know, a lot of um, obstructive emotions coming up. Sometimes we can carry on anyway and just see if it softens. Um, but sometimes we want to go back then to the neutral or to the loved person to build the fire up again. We don't want the fire to go out. But eventually, and I even experienced this with one of my um, participants to my Zoom sessions, because we do loving kindness most weeks. We do guided meditations 
kind of incrementally through the groups, and then we start again with the self, carry on. And she said that when she got to the difficult person, the metta became stronger. And I thought that was really interesting. She was surprised. But this is what can happen, you know, when the fire's ready, because we really don't want to suffer, right? Does anyone here want to suffer? <laughs> I don't know, you laugh, but actually a lot of the time we kind of keep ourselves suffering because we kind of feel we don't deserve not to or something perverse. But, um, but yeah, when we really understand that we don't have to and there are ways to alleviate that suffering, especially by alleviating or uprooting those roots of harm in ourselves, then... Uh, slowly we open to the possibility of love. So even if it's just an intention, this is wonderful. Of course, it starts with thought, and I had wanted to get on to working with thought, which I'm not going to be able to do now, but um, maybe we can bring that into the questions or something. But uh, just to sum up, um, it's also important to practice in all these different modes, you know, in the mode of sense restraint, using our perception in a more active way, when actual situations arise in daily life. And, of course, also aligning our intentions with right view, right view and also right motivation, having a relationship with the object in front of us that is a relationship of peace, a relationship of kindness. And what actually starts to happen is quite magical. It's almost like emotional alchemy or something. If you regard something with peace, you know, I really love this phrase that my teacher uses. He says, make an armistice with your mind. Make a ceasefire. I looked up the meaning of armistice. Armistice? And it, may, it means something like um, a temporary ceasefire uh, so that a lasting resolution for peace can be found. So we just stop the war, at least temporarily. We make peace with our experience. We make peace with our mind. And if we do that long enough, looking at what arises with a sense of peace, acceptance, then we actually start to experience peace. It's as though what began as an attitude, what began as a perception, becomes the object of our mind. It grows so strong that it becomes the object. It's the same with loving kindness. We might start just by having this, not just by, by having kindfulness, by regarding whatever's arising, even if it seems to be the antithesis of metta, you know, a mood of grumpiness or depression or outright ill will. You know, we start to regard that with kindly eyes, with a sense of softness and understanding. And after a while, what you start to notice is your experience has changed into kindness. Kindness now becomes your object of mind. So this is how the motivation can start to, or the way of rela relating can start to actually um, cultivate loving kindness as a lasting state of mind. Yeah? And this can take us into the deeper states of samadhi the metta, metta jhana, if you like. So, carry on the practice, however you can, whenever it's suitable and appropriate, given the situation, but perhaps try to include some of this guarding of the senses between your meditations when you go outside, you know, notice how you're relating to sight. Are you relating to it with, oh, it's a bit cloudy and windy, it's making me miserable, or actually it's not windy but it's that kind of grey. Or are you sort of seeing the beauty and getting inspired? It's okay to get inspired from nature. That's a wholesome kind of joy. So just notice, you don't need to judge it, but just notice and see if you can perceive in a slightly different way. And uh, other than that, practice however is nourishing for you. But my offering again today will be to work with the loved person and um, I'm not sure how much guidance is helpful because I'm trying to pitch it at a level that's suitable for most. I know some of the people here haven't been on a retreat before, quite a few. And uh, generally in that case, it could be good to have a bit of extra guidance. For those who really don't need to hear all the step-by-step, -step, just try and zone it out a bit and just go through the stages in your own speed and your own time. And allowing the mind to settle and enjoy the actual emotion of loving-kindness.